ahead and get started. Um, I will call the ISD 191 Legislative Committee meeting to order. Today is Monday, December the 21st at 5 p.m. And we have several guests here tonight. I think we'll start by having everybody maybe just briefly introduce themselves and tell us just very quickly a little bit about yourself. And I'll just go first. Um, I'm Scott Hume. I live here in Burnsville. Um, I have two kids currently in the district, plus one who is in finishing out, has about a year left of college at uh, Minnesota State Moorhead. He, he graduated from Burnsville in 2017. Um, it's my first term on the school board, so I'm about halfway through my first term. And that's all I have to say for now. Eric, do you want to go next? Certainly, certainly. Thank you. Welcome uh, for our guests today. My name is Eric Miller. Um, I'm in my uh, ending my first term and starting my second in a week or a couple weeks here um, in, with the 191 school board, currently the vice chair. Um, I live over in Savage, so District 56 for you guys. And I know you think in terms of districts rather than towns. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I've got three kids. Uh, my oldest is at Eagle Ridge. Uh, as a uh, seventh grader, and I have a fourth grader and, and a kindergartner, Harriet Bishop. So I'm involved with the district and been around for a while and will be for quite a while still you know, that time in. So thanks. Welcome again for joining us, guys. Thanks, Eric. And I see our third board member, Leslie, has joined us. So Leslie, we're just doing very brief introductions. Oh, okay, Let's great. Start. I'm sorry. I was just I was just on actually a phone call with um, Chair Olt. So I apologize yes. for we'll, we'll allow it. Late. <laughs> um, although my, my laptop just says it turned five, so <laughs> it was actually on time. So I'm sorry. Um, I'm Leslie Chester. Um, I've been um, part of the school board now for two years. I'm an Egan resident um, living over here off of um, right near the outlet mall. Uh, <laughs> um, I've been a resident of Egan um, for 22 years, so since 98. Um, and I have two children in the district, one a 10th grader at Burnsville High School and a second grader at Ron Elementary. Um, and just have been a longtime supporter um, and advocate for our students, as well as have had a lot of um, work in them um, with Egan. So I know, I know Sandy. Hi, Sandy. <laughs> and I also know Jim Carlson, or my, or my, both my senator and representative. So I'm very glad to see you both. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. I'm Superintendent Teresa Battle. And this is my second year as superintendent of Burnsville Egan Savage School District. I'd like to welcome all of you. Some are new for me, a couple of familiar faces. Um, so thanks for joining us tonight. Anybody want to volunteer to go next? I'll go next. Uh, I'm Aaron Tinklenberg. I'm the district's communications director worked in the district for almost 10 years and uh, as the director for the last um, two and a half. And I have uh, two um, children, one of whom graduated from Burnsville High School in uh, 2019. I'm Lisa Ryder, Executive Director of Business Services with ISD 191. And I've been with the district for going on 15 years now. And I started in the finance department as a director and moved into this role in 20, 2009 it was. So um, I work with most of the operational side of the district with regard to transportation, food nutrition, community ed, finance, and um, just operations transportation. Yep, thanks. All right, we'll just go in the order you all appear on my screen. So Liz, you are next. Okay, uh, I'm Liz Ryer, representative elect for House District 51B. Um, so swearing in for the first time two weeks from tomorrow. Not that I'm counting the days or excited. <laughs> Um, I have lived in Egan for almost 30 years. Uh, I lived pretty close to you, Leslie, for many of those years, just near Meadowlands Park uh, on the Oak Ridge side of Ron. 
my kids all went to District 196 schools. We have four kids, uh, so they uh, all graduates of Eastview. And now we are empty nesting over on the other side of the district. Um, very happy to be here. Welcome. Um, looks like Greg, I believe you are next on my screen. Well, thank you. Well, good evening. My name is Greg Clausen. I'm a member of the Minnesota Senate and I serve the communities of Apple Valley, Rosemont, Northeast Lakeville and Coates. Uh, Burnsville Schools is just a small little piece of the area that I represent south of 35E and east of uh, County Road 11. Uh, that's, there's a portion of the Burnsville Schools in, that, in my area. Um, I'm in my third term uh, in the Senate. My background is in education. I was a classroom teacher, uh, assistant principal at Apple Valley High School, uh, principal at Rosemont High School for 15 years. And then I also served in the District 196 uh, district office for a period of time, uh, 45 years as an educator. And it took me about one week once elected to know I could not do both jobs, working at the district office and being a senator. So being a senator now is my full-time job. And thanks for the invitation to be with you this evening. We're so glad you were able to join us. All right, it looks like uh, Sandy Mason is next. Okay, can you hear me? We hear you. Hello everyone. Uh, I have lived in this district for a long, long time. All three of my children graduate, well, they went to Ron, they went to Metcalf, and they graduated from Burnsville High School. And I did spend a number of years on the Community Ed Advisory Council, and then also, I later on, I was also on the Communications Committee when they re, uh, reinstalled that committee. And I really, you know, I know there's a lot going on, uh, so again, I appreciate you having this meeting. Thank you. And then last but not least is Jim Carlson. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Scott. I'm Jim Carlson and uh, I have a very shy camera here and I'm trying to figure out how to get logged in on my, uh, on my phone. So you'll probably see another identity trying to get in here under, under that name, but uh, camera is, is rather erratic. Uh, I'm the same. They do that sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the senator from District 51, and uh, I'm entering my 13th year as senator here, and I represent uh, most of Egan and about perhaps uh, around a third of Burnsville, something like that, and uh, I live in Egan, and I've lived here my entire life, and uh, so long that when I was 10 years old, uh, and we were driving by the original Burnsville High School when it was under construction and we saw a fire going on there, my father got out and threw sand on it and put it out. So otherwise, okay. Burnsville High School would have burned as a construction site back then. So uh, I've seen just about everything happen in these two communities. And I'm often known as the person that has the little known and little sought after facts. <laughs> right. So anyway, I'm, I'm happy to be on this meeting with you. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to talking about all these issues because they are getting pretty important. And I think, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have a rough year this year because uh, the people that you have on here are, I believe everyone that is here is in the minority except for Sandy and Liz. And they're on that edge, ragged edge right now. So it's, uh, it's looking like it's gonna be a tough year. Uh, we're thankful that we have a, um, a positive balance in the budget that at least we can do a few things, but uh, it's not going to be necessarily good for the next two year budget. So we're looking forward to whatever we can do together. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you for joining us. So a couple of you have attended these meetings in the past and when we've had our state legislators attend, we've, we've tended to keep it pretty informal and it really just looking at it as kind of a conversation, getting to hear from you kind of what you see as some of the priorities around education, what we see as some of the priorities um, for us in the coming year. Um, if there's anything that you're hearing about from constituents about the district that you have questions about or that have come up that you'd like to make us aware of. Um, and that's that's really what this is for. It's, it's really generally pretty 
informal um, and just m very much a conversation. We don't have a long presentation for you or anything. It's really, let's just, let's just talk. Let's just learn about each other. Let's just learn about the priorities, um, what's important to us, what's important to you and, and just, just, just start there. So um, Eric, Leslie, do either of you have anything to add or Dr. Battle? I'll jump in for just a second because um, although we're, at, I think this is what the third year or second and a half year of, um, of this committee, I still consider it really relatively new. Mm -hmm. It's a concept that hasn't been in place at, the, at 191 for um, uh, well, at least for a very long time, if, if, if ever, I'm not sure about that. But um, and when, we, when we kind of got it kicked off a few years ago, you know, it, we sat down and said, what do we want to do with this? And, I think conversation is the key cornerstone of, of what this is all about. It's an opportunity as peers to, to get together, elected official peers to get together and talk a little bit, um, have some dialogue. Uh, we'd like to hear from you guys. Uh, you know, um, if you're hearing things that uh, confuse you or you have concerns, we'd like to let you know, because this is a great opportunity to set some facts straight. Um, we, uh, we would like to know where things are, you know, if there's anything you can give us an insight on where direction is headed. And it's also a place that if you have some major issue that you think is going to be something we, we as a board are going to need to start discussing, contemplating, working on how our position might be on, this would be the launching point to bring it to this committee so that we could start, um, you know, uh, uh, digesting the idea and getting ready for to talk as a, a whole board. Um, and then sort of the third pillar uh, of this uh, is for us to create internally a legislative um uh, platform, if you will, it's it, we don't. That's almost too too strong a word for what we do with it. But you know, it's kind of a point that where we put some points we can put out to to you, your counterparts, and the public about where we you know if we have any sort of uh, things that are hot items as far as a board um, that's happening you know up at, in St. Paul. So so yeah, the conversation is the key point. It's very casual, very laid back. We just love to hear from you um, and and interact a little bit. Do you want us to raise our hands or just talk? Oh, I'd jump in. If we were I think it's a table. small enough group, we can just talk, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I guess, my, well, first of all, I think as far as I know, this committee has only existed for a couple of years when Superintendent Battle come, came in. I don't ever remember 191 having that before. So I'm really glad we have, have a legislative committee now. I guess one of the questions I have has to do with the sale of the buildings. Um, and I can tell you, I've got, I know one young man that moved into uh, the, a neighborhood by Sioux Trail. They don't have kids yet, but they specifically bought the house over there because they were gonna be near the school. And so obviously they are not really happy campers at this point, but uh, you know, it seems to me you've sold, how are you dealing with the money that you're, if you're selling the buildings, et cetera, how are you dealing with the money and how does that help your financial situation? Scott, you want to walk point or do you want me to go through this? You, if you want to go ahead. Well, actually it's funny you bring that up because that's, uh, <laughs> some of you are probably aware that that's something we're going to be asking for some assistance from you guys on. Um, the, to be honest, and I'll let Dr. Battle get into the weeds of it. She knows a little bit more about the details than I do, but uh, or, or Lisa. But to be honest, I mean, we don't have any money yet. No sales have been negotiated yet. Uh, we're still in sort of the early phases of that, including and there's pieces of it, right? So there's because there's act, there's sale activity that would be involved with Diamond Head or the, well, the outlots of Diamond Head, um, sort of the footprint of Diamond Head, not the building itself, but. Um, uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have a number of buildings that are in the mix on this. And um, so there are some considerations. Uh, there's some uh, recruit, um, uh, I don't know if you even call them RFPs, Lisa, but but we, we have uh, requests out for brokers and things like that. So th there's conversations going on. But what we, when I say we need to, some help from you folks, and I'm going to really be rough about this because I don't know the exact terminology, but my understanding is state laws when a organization such as ours sells something and there's proceeds, those have to go immediately to the retirement of debt. And um, we're looking for assistance because there is precedent um, having occurred before where um, we get an exemption on that from the legislature um, so that we can apply those proceeds to the general fund um, or 
to earmark for future development, depending on the, 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 the desire of the board. Um, Lisa, do you or, or Dr. Battle, anybody else want to add to that? Lisa, you can only go. add uh, that you are correct in, in what you've said, that uh, state statutes uh, indicate you have to, if you have outstanding bonds, you have to retire those rather than go to the general fund, but you can get an exemption and um, Superintendent Battle and I have talked about that and others and certainly willing to help with that. Uh, there was a school district two years ago and smaller school district that uh, did exactly what you're looking to do and uh, got that exemption. So uh, you're still in the planning stages, it sounds like, but once you've kind of finalized things, uh, we should talk and we'll put together uh, a bill and uh, see if we can't uh, work through that. So our, our debt that we have currently um, comes from the 2015 bond issuance, which was utilized for the purpose of adding on to our high school to be able to bring our ninth graders there. So we have a nine through 12 high school and um, district-wide accomplish a number of secure entries to buildings as well as our middle school program so that we could um, address some of the needs there going to a six, seven, eight middle school versus the junior high uh, model we had previously. That required a bond issuance, okay? Other than that, we had our OPEB issuance in 2009, which allowed for us to set money aside for our other post-employment benefits. The other debt that we have incurred has come from alt facility projects. So what that means is it's been projects that have been across all of our sites. So it's not any debt that is related to any one building, but rather some remodel or um, adjustments were made for the alt facility um, using bond proceeds in a number of different buildings on any given issue. And so you see pieces across all of the different buildings. So we've gone through that exercise of identifying how many dollars were spent in each of our buildings. And for those buildings that are potentially vacant and up for sale, um, how much of that debt then must be recovered from proceeds and addressed under current statute or um, you know, if we were able to uh, be successful in passing legislation that would allow us to go to the general fund, then we would be bypassing that, continue to pay our debt as we have. We've done a number of uh, refinancing of our debt over the last uh, 10 years that has saved significant dollars for our taxpayers and we continue to do so. And we are currently leasing out one of our buildings to 917, half of the building at Cedar is um, utilized by their programming which allows us also to bring that money into the debt service fund to help offset some of the debt related to that particular building too. So what I would add is it's uh, interesting how we've had to respond to COVID-19. And uh, one of the ways we have responded, as you know, our governor did ask for school districts to step in to help with childcare for our healthcare workers, as well as our first responders. So Sue Trail and MW Savage are both being utilized for that. And so we actually had an inquiry from a neighboring district if they could use one of our uh, open facilities because they didn't have the room to provide some in-person learning for hybrid. And so we, please know we've been utilizing those spaces. Um, the other property, uh, Metcalf, we actually have a long, I wouldn't call it a long-term lease, but a, a permit user. Is it open door, Lisa, for uh, food insecurity in our communities? And so they operate there. Um, so they've asked for a multi-week to respond to the needs of the community. So as uh, Director Miller said, we don't have a sale pending but we do hope that we will. And then the request is to use the proceeds other than for- um, Yeah, I would just, I mean, to the point, I mean, COVID obviously has disrupted our plans and, and, and you know, slowed things down a bit. Um, and um, San, Sandy, to, to your point um, with your constituent, I, I, you know, we all fully appreciate the, um, the, the where people are, coming at from it, it's, uh, it was 
easily the hardest thing any of us have done or will probably do in this role um, to make that decision on what, you know, to close schools and what schools to close. Um, all, you know, all I can respond with is uh, empathy. And then, you know, if you, if, if you want to get logical about it, we did a very extensive um, research project uh, that was, uh, you know, is available somewhere, you know, Aaron could help you find that. I'm sure do this out on our uh, um, district website that just pointed out that what was pretty obvious to everybody is this district has dramatically decreased in enrollment uh, over the years and at sitting at 10 elementary, uh, three middle schools, you know, you know, well, two high schools essentially with our alternative high school was just too many buildings. Uh, we were underutilizing every one of our buildings. And so, you know, at the end of the day, it was, it was just, it was irresponsible for us as stewards of the, the, the district resources to continue operating in that, in that model. Um, so we had to do something and take some action. The hope is that this, the, the proceeds and, and the, um, the retraction that comes with it uh, will be able to realign us better to, to serve the existing group of students that we have with better resources. Um, we're not, um, you know, there is obviously going to be some staff that's uh, redundant, but it, my understanding that's fairly limited. Um, you know, kids still need the teachers. <laughs> you know, we may not need exactly as many custodians or lunch uh, person uh, personnel, unfortunately, but, um, but for the most part, uh, this is not an impact of staff. It's mostly just departing with buildings and you know, having owned a few houses in my life, uh, buildings are have sentimental value, but they are ultimately sometimes you have to move on. So that you know, that's a decision we had to make. And no, I, looking at your, and I uh, the newcomer to the group, could you just give me a sense of how many schools and what kind of amount of money we're talking about? How and I bet you're also wondering when we said District Nine One Seven. Do you know what that is, perchance? You are familiar with that, Liz. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I didn't know if you're. That one is a. Uh, sometimes a little vague for some people. Um, yeah. yeah, Lisa, do you wanna take a shot at that sure. question? Prior to um, this year, we had been operating eight, I'm sorry, 10 elementary schools, three middle schools, and our main high school, as well as our alternative high school, and another building, which is for our best program, our Burnsville Egan Savage Transition Program for 21 years and older. Um, when we, did the bond issuance back in 2015. The goal was to bring all of those spaces that we were leasing outside of 191 for our programming in-house and utilize our own, our own resources, which we did. Um, but then with the enrollment continuing to decline, and as I look at our enrollment projection file um, since 2010, but I know it was also since 2003, I think that we've been declining. So, I mean, it's been a, a, a number of years where this has been the case. And so we've just reached a point where as, um, Director Miller indicated it was it was really um, how do we best utilize the sources resources we have and the savings did come from the closure of the of um, two of the elementary schools and one middle school so that leaves us with now eight elementary schools two middle schools and our high school and um, alternative high school and our best program still we are looking to potentially sell the building that our best program is within which would move them over to Diamond Head along with the administration that we have there and our early childhood programming. So you're looking at selling one building? Is that what it comes to? Well, uh, River Ridge Education Center is a possibility as well as Metcalf Middle School land and or building depending upon what is decided um, and what offers they may be. There is also the conversation of between two and four acres at the Diamond Head lot. So it's land only, not the building. That would be potentially sold for purposes of uh, likely a residential housing of some kind. Okay. Did I miss something? I think, that no, I think that's it. good. It, you know, it's been an interesting journey. None of us are in commercial real estate. Well, maybe not obvious, but we, none of us are in commercial real estate in our real life or real day jobs or whatever you want to call it. Um, and so it's been an interesting experience. We've had everything from you're sitting on the hottest ticket in town to you're going to barely break even on this sale. So um, we really don't know what's going to happen until we actually put the hook in the water and wait and see what happens. Uh, I think we were hearing some of those comments before COVID. So it's even more uncertain now than it was, you know, eight, nine, 10 months ago. 
Yeah. And speaking of, of COVID and your October 1 count, how close were you to your projection, student numbers wise? Total students, we were, um, our, our projections were very conservative for this fall, given the fact that we had just closed buildings. So when that happens, there can be oftentimes a de like decrease in your enrollment. So we had taken that into consideration. So total enrollment was fairly close. However, the number of families that we know are entitled to free or reduced benefit, that was far smaller than what we normally see. And we, we assume that has to do with the fact that, you know, with the, the way things are functioning now, students are being uh, provided meals without any cost. And so there wasn't the necessity understood by families to necessarily complete that application. So that's been that's been challenging. We've made a few different pushes for that information, but that's that's certainly something that families have struggled with understanding the need and, for. And that's been the case statewide. It's not, yes. mm -hmm. probably nationally, but for, certainly I've heard about it in, in many other districts in Minnesota. And we Any also have the- statewide, um, the kindergarten enrollment statewide and yes. national. Yeah, I was gonna point that out too. We saw the kindergarten dip uh, and, and I guess anecdotally, most people are, um, connecting that to people that don't necessarily have to put their kid into kindergarten this year, they can start next year and they just don't want to in the COVID environment start. So. Right. But thinking about the longer term decline, you said since 2003 or so, uh, is that demographic in nature? Um, and therefore if older families sell and you'll see your demand go up again, or is it competition from charters? What's, what's uh, the I'll take this because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty blunt about this. Um, the, uh, it, yes, to some degree, there is, there is some aging out in Burnsville, um, but that is not the primary driving force. Um, if you look at the ins and outs, so the, the folks that are open and rolling out, um, and not just to private and charter, but primarily to other districts around us, um, and, and then balance that with the ins. We are one of the highest districts in the state, and that that's not a percentage; that's a pure number. And that I think we outperform, unfortunately, Anoka and Ramsey. I believe at least, uh, or maybe we're very close. I, going back to that report we had two years ago, now it was pretty darn close. Um, so what is what's driving that? Well, as you know, the district is a banana-shaped district. It runs along the river, so we're confined on the north side by the river. Um, we have. Uh, Apple Valley, Egan, Lakeville, Prior Lake along our borders, um, all very affluent, all very white districts. We are a dynamically changing district um, with a very diverse different uh, population than those communities around us. If you look at the open enrollment numbers going out of our district, it is dramatically a white set of folks that are leaving the district. So it's, it's, it, all you have to do is look at the numbers. It's very, very clear what's going on. There's choice being made to enroll elsewhere, which is unfortunate because if you do the numbers and sit down and look at the, the, the what's available, um, you know, I've heard anecdotally the superintendent of Prior Lake has told folks that he wishes he could give some, of, at least a fraction of the programming that we offer here in Burnsville. So, you know, what we do for our students, what we provide uh, per student, um, you know, whether it's in social emotional help or uh, or um, advanced programming on my, my student, my oldest is a straight A taking numerous honor courses. I anticipate to have one or two years of college under his belt, given per courtesy of the district before he leaves the district. You know, it's amazing what we can offer here, um, but pe people just don't realize it. You know, um, they don't, they need to come see the high school. And I'm assume you guys all have had a talk to you one time or another to see what changed at Burnsville High School. There's amazing stuff there that just is not available anywhere, not even just out the river, not anywhere around. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a problem of uh, misinformation and misinterpretation and uh, assumptions about what's going on in the community. So that that is the uh, <laughs> that's the quick of it. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, and that's one of the more intractable intractable issues it could be too, is trying to reverse white flight. Yes. You know, I did want to make one comment because I moved into 191 shortly after Cedar Cedar School was closed. And that impacted the area that I lived in. And I know 
it took a long time for people to get over that closure. And even though you're using it for something else, as I said, it, 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 it took a long time. And so the fact that you're doing some major closures, closures I know, yeah, I appreciate the decisions you had to make, but I know it's, it's really difficult and it's got to be really difficult to deal with uh, the impact that it made on the surrounding areas. But like Eric said, it was definitely a very difficult decision to make. No doubt. Yeah. No doubt. I've lived in Minneapolis and St. Paul and, and my oldest went to St. Paul schools and there were all of the, the changes and, and that type of thing. And so the question then becomes, you know, you have to do it, right? I mean, you just can't make it go away. So how do you work with the community and what type of um, communications, I guess I'm looking at Aaron now, or, or at all of us, um, to say how do you then help people get across that and process their feelings and not deny them. The coach in me is coming out, I admit it, but there is that piece where when people feel like they're heard, they can move forward. And so that's the step that I think becomes really important. Well, I think the un one of the unfortunate things is there were a lot of <clears throat> plans made to help with that transition, um, you know, to give people that closure when the schools were actually closing last spring and then COVID happened and all of that they was, wasn't able to happen in person. So that make probably, I imagine that probably also made it more difficult for some, some of the affected families and the staff that they didn't really get that opportunity to have that closure as their school was closing. Yeah, and, and then also the, the transition and welcome, really welcoming into yeah. the, the, the new the school. Small. Yeah, because with the, with the three school, the three school closures, the, you know, the middle school and Sioux Trail are over here on the, on the Egan end. And so I think that's where there was probably a larger feel of, of impact um, because of, of both of the schools being very close to one another. And then, um, and then being able to really open up the, the welcome from into Ron into Burn, you know, which are the next schools nearby, um, because of the pandemic. Really, our 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 goal and our our um, intent wasn't able to to come to fruition because of the of the pandemic. But maybe after, you know, maybe there's going to still be opportunities once um, we get through this pandemic. <laughs> Yeah, I would encourage if you if you come across folks that you know are speaking in anecdotal terms, that might what we often hear is, I love my elementary, um, you know, I, I maybe even I love my middle school, um, but I just really don't think I want my kid to go to that high school, and um, you know, so I gotta switch now. I gotta leave now because you know they're gonna close the door and I can't get into Apple Valley any you know in the future or Fire Lake or whatever it is. I would really encourage them to call. You know, of course, post COVID, obviously you can't do it now, but well, maybe you can. I don't know. Anyway, uh, I would encourage them to contact um, Principal Helke and go get a tour. Challenge them. Say, have you been over to the New Burnsville High School and have you seen what's available over there? Um, are they aware of our Pathways programming? If you don't know what that is. You know, a while back, um, this board sat down and said, in reality, not every kid is going to graduate and go to college. Um, we want to graduate every kid ready for uh, an experience to be, a, uh, you know, a, a, um, an individual contributing member of, of our community in the future. But that doesn't necessarily mean everybody's going to go to college. We have people that might want to go on to be nurses or go on to be um, uh, small engine repair folks or whatever it might be. And so we have a programming there now that sets up courses for that. We have an automotive, uh, um, you know, work area that Walzer has donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to, and we have some equipment there that they don't even have in their shops around town here. Um, we have small engine engines repair area donated by Toro. We have a nursing program, a culinary award-winning culinary program is going on at the high school. We run a, um, uh, a, um, uh, credit union, an active credit union run by the students 
a member of a, a branch of the Firefly Credit Union is in the high school over there. Um, you know, it and there's marketing and there's there's you know all, we're working on an EM. I think we have an active EMT programming. Um, you know, working with the police and fire department to uh, get kids started in the training activity for that to support that. So. I mean, and, and of course, we're still graduating tons of kids that go to college, but, um, you know, people need to see that. Um, my wife graduated uh, from Burnsville High School, let's just say before the year 2000 sometime. Um, so I'll stay out of trouble. Um, but, you know, she hadn't been there. She honestly hadn't been there for quite a while. And it was like my first year in this role. And um, we were having the state of the, the, the um, uh, district. A presentation I invited her to come along and she and I took a walking tour beforehand and sat down and and, we'll, and she leaned over to me and she said can I go back to high school here this is amazing this is like a different place than where I went to high school yeah you know that's what people just don't understand they they have this vision of the older building and the you know the dark hallways and stuff they grew up with and it's just not like that over there anymore uh, maker spaces engineering stuff going on it's amazing what's going on at our high school and like I said you go to some of these very nice, very well. I grew up right, very close to where Lakeville North High School is. A beautiful building, but they don't have the facilities we have sitting right here in Burnsville. So people need to come see that. Physically, it shines like a diamond if they get, if they manage to get over there. That's the problem. Yeah, I agree with Eric. I, I've done work with Intermediate District 288, which is in Scott and Carver County. And, and they're like the 917 for, for that area. And 288 provides the career in tech. So they have the career in tech as an intermediate district that the member districts bring their students to, to have our district have the career tech on site is huge. A, a question I have, and we have a number of students during the COVID are, are falling behind. And the question is, what are we gonna do about that as we move forward? Uh, I've had some discussions with um, ASMD and, and others or AMSD and talking about, would it be helpful at all for you to have the ability to use compensatory aid during the school day to work specifically with uh, children that have fallen behind, students that have fallen behind? I'm going to defer to Dr. Battle on this one. Dr. Battle, that's you. <laughs> so uh, I'll ask Lisa to help me with this. So I think uh, that is one possibility. But as I look at our cross subsidy um, for special education, our English language learners, I think we could better utilize if we had the cross subsidy addressed too. And so the compensatory. I think we, once we get the applications in, and as Lisa said earlier, there is a decrease. And so we actually made an effort over the past two weeks to get all of our families to um, submit their application. But I think that is one ideal, but I think actually is that cross subsidy that may help us even more. And so Lisa, you wanna to add to that? Certainly, we have a very strong program for our, uh, we call it PALS and BYC. That's the elementary and the middle school program that serves our students after school, before and after school, or um, during the summer months. So we've been very successful with that program over the last um, five to six years, particularly. So our, um, you know, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Battle with regard to the where the need is greater. Um, probably in that cross subsidy we're experiencing on the EL and special ed more so just because we've got it figured out on the compensatory how to generate that revenue by serving students outside of that school day. Um, it then doesn't disrupt from their other normal classwork and it does certainly serve them as extra time with those students that we have with them. So just to follow up, we do have a somewhat unique model with our middle schools where we utilize during the day. You wanna cover that, Lisa? So I think maybe that's what AMSD is thinking of, but we already employ that. Yeah, so we also utilize our school within a school. We are a, a full service ALC for sure. Um, so during our school day, our middle schoolers also have the opportunity during certain courses for them to obtain the extra help that they're needing in various different um, reading or math areas. Sometimes it's even in the science area. 
And so we focus very heavily on, on those courses then that can help those students kind of get what they need during that period of time. And then that is also seat time connected with our schools in a school. I do have a, a bill too that you probably know the ESSA plan requires you now to have a partner uh, for the ALC. And I've got a bill to, to change that, to do away with that because districts like yours, 196, you have the capacity to run your own and it would be actually be a, a hindrance and cost more to try to actually um, form some type of relationship with another partner. So. At minimum, at minimum, if we need to do that partnership, which we already know we can work with Prior Lake Savage and Shakopee on that process to fulfill the state statute. But if we didn't need to do that, that would be wonderful because we could continue what we are doing. Right. Um, but even if we join with the others, we know we need to ask for that to be each of us being our own fiscal host, because then you put that all into one pot, that's when things get really messy and a whole lot more time consuming. So yep. we need to keep it as clean as possible. Yep. I agree. They give that uh, requirement for the, the four, uh, well, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Rochester, and Duluth, but some of those districts are smaller than some of the larger districts in our state. So we need to be fair on that whole issue. So hopefully I'll be successful on that. Thank <laughs> we'll you. See. Yes, thank you for that, Senator Coulson. I want to answer. And I, I, I've, I'm a, if you haven't gotten it, learned it yet, I'm a shameless uh, cheerleader for our district. Um, I'll, uh, Senator Klaus, and I'll challenge you a little bit. I, I, yes, obviously, COVID is an absolute, um, uh, not, not ideal in any way for all of our students, but uh, we're doing pretty well here in the district. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it, across as an aggregate, we obviously have a, a, a lot of bodies of uh, students that are challenged by the environment, and there's, we have a lot of challenges in front of us, but uh, and, and we haven't been able to do a lot of testing, so the truth will be in the tape when, it, when we get there. But um, um, I know Dr. Battles uh, and her team have worked really hard, uh, and I'm not suggesting you were saying otherwise, but they work really hard to um, not just uh, send kids home with a, a laptop and some you know, videos to watch. Um, you know, we have a, a pretty in-depth uh, educational program that's going on. Uh, I have three kids in school during the day in my house and they're all very active and very busy throughout the day. So um, another, another thing that I don't think a lot of people realize is, you know, I, I, cause I hear, I know people that are teaching in laboring districts and such, and they're often very surprised about what we're accomplishing here in this district uh, at this time, given the environment we're in right now. So. I'm just gonna add on to that, that I think we were able to get a head start. I think a lot of districts have caught up to us somewhat this fall, but in the spring, because of the tech levy that was passed back in 2015, 2016, I think it was 2015, we already had enough devices for every student in the district to have something so that I think a lot of districts weren't able to do that even maybe, I don't know about middle school and high school, but certainly not at the elementary level. And so that gave us a leg up even in the spring to be able to do a better job initially at least, um, and gave it gave us that Jump start we needed on what has turned out to be probably longer than any of us thought it would be nine months ago when schools were shutting down. So I think that's been, and that's because of that levy that was passed five years so, ago. So a note on that I know the legislature will be talking about access to broadband. So what was illuminating for us? It, 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 the inequities in our system were illuminated, but it, we were somewhat stunned that our employees didn't have access to even engage in distance learning. That they lived in areas they couldn't connect. Right. And then there wasn't an option for them to come back to the school sites. So I just want to put that in there too. That was very illuminating through That's COVID. Did you have to spend quite a bit on hotspots for kids and, and uh, faculty? We have a significant number of dollars that have gone towards that, absolutely. Um, I think it's been in excess of three hundred thousand dollars for sure. Ooh, wow! So One of the we things view we that as a utility, just like electricity and gas. We're in an age now you have to be connected, yeah. so that access and opportunity is just crucial. One of the things we should investigate um, is that we do have a statewide broadband uh, grant process. 
And I was able to get one for Rosemont uh, in the northern part of Rosemont. And we should investigate that for uh, Burnsville schools and see where you really have needs. And we can, uh, we can write a grant and see if we can be successful on that. So we'll follow up on that. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Jim Carlson, I think yeah. he's yet to unmute. I'm, can you hear me? I think you can. Yep, we hear I, you. It's like I have two steering wheels here. Uh, but uh, I want to ask uh, to, to help me be comfortable. I'm sure you've done this, but I'm wondering what, uh, what type of investigation you've done as far as these neighborhoods that might be, uh, might be under reversal sometime soon. For instance, uh, Cedar Grove, and I think Sandy knows that, that that was, Cedar Grove is probably the neighborhood that has more original owners than any other neighborhood in Egan. And they are going to die off. That was primarily because of the GI Bill back in, in the 50s and 60s, that uh, most of those were GI Bill homes. And a lot of GIs came in there and they stuck with those homes and they are still in those homes. Sooner or later, that's gonna reverse and there'll be that traditional sale of homes and the traditional, you know, I don't know what you call it, but we do in my neighborhood, the, suddenly Halloween will be important again and you can come to your doors because there'll be a lot of kids in the neighborhood and then it reverses again and then there's the kids move out. Uh, you know, that particular um, situation plus what about those situations where uh, you might make a change in a school and suddenly the people who have been uh, not considering Burnsville will consider, for instance, a uh, magnet school. Now that happened in Egan with uh, um, Glacier Hills Elementary where people did not wanna go to Glacier, Glacier Hills. And once we had the evaluation and once they were considered a, uh, uh, what, what did you call, what's the terminology for that when they're 20% under the average of uh, diversity, suddenly they became a STEM school and they even called it a STEAM school. And now the demand for Glacier Hills is huge. And what that does to the people that go there is, and, and you all probably experienced trying to change a boundary. And that's probably one of the most emotional things you can do is change a boundary because all the parents want their kids to go to school with their friends. And, and so what's, what happens is that, uh, for instance, I'm now in the Blackhawk uh, service area for District 196. And there were a lot, or there are a lot of kids in this neighborhood who would otherwise go to Egan High School. And they're saying, I want to be with my friends. So I'm going to Eastview. And so what that means is that you have a you know, a group of these kids that want to be with their friends. And so whether or not Eastview has the same thing, offers the same thing that Egan does, and I, I think they're fairly close, they want to go with their friends and they'll go with, they'll go to Eastview just because of that. So is there, is there any phenomenon like that that you've looked into? Plus then there's another phenomenon, like for instance, let's say if you sell off uh, Metcalf, there's a lot of open land there. And we have a lot of need for housing, lower, lower cost housing for there and for, you know, even at the, uh, the headquarters there on, uh, on Burnsville Parkway, you know, could some of those areas become another hotspot for a lot of bedrooms? And then now you have another situation where you're going to have to serve those bedrooms. So, and I'm sure you've looked into this, but I just have to get a little more comfort sure. language from you. I'll I'll um I'll start with all that. I'm going to work it backwards. The, the last point you made about the, the Metcalf property, um, Egan has, to my knowledge, has been very um, uh, clear with us that that property will not be um, a multi-home dwelling. Um, Lisa, is that I think that's a fair generalized statement, right? To... It would require a change to their plan. So at this point in time, it's not considered to be an area that they would look for multi-family housing, yes. Yeah, so if it's residential, it'll be single family housing, which is still would provide a fair amount of homes, but not as Dan says, obviously. Um, the, uh, the phenomenon you're talking about of, of 
transitioning neighborhoods, Burnsville has quite a few neighborhoods and Savage uh, gone through that. I myself am in a home uh, that my in-laws built in 89 and this was a very young neighborhood at the time and then it went quiet for a, a decade or so and now we have residents who are amazed about the number of kids running around in the neighborhood. So, um, it, you know, so it, yes, it does happen and uh, we're aware of it. Um, the, the unfortunate numbers game that we're playing with enrollment um, is so in decline that, I mean, we, we lose an additional negative amount, usually of 100 or 200 per year. So even if we were to somehow just stem that decline, we would still be very negative from where we were, as Lisa said, 10 years ago or whatever. So we have quite a road to climb back to, to be kind of where Burnsville was in its heyday. So um, it's, it's not just a matter of um, stemming the tide. It will be stemming the tide and turning the flow back around and going back up the hill with it. So, and then as far as, um, you know, yes, we, we understand the attraction. Uh, and, and I think 196 is a, probably a little bit of a different game because you have such a large um, population over uh, and geographic footprint there. Um, we did have some magnet programming here in 191. We ironically um, put an end to it here. I would say it kind of had a slow death and then we finally put it away uh, just last year. And what our finding, our experience with that was, um, because we had um, Harriet Bishop, which was a magnet for gifted and talented programming. Um, we had um, uh, STEM programming over on the other side. Uh, what we found was even though we offered uh, transportation options to all students in the district, the majority of the students that were able to take advantage of that programming were affluent and white. Um, and it was not serving all the needs of our community. And so we, just, we have um, learned that it is far more beneficial rather than putting a label on a particular school to use those resources equitably throughout the district um, and make sure that any child that needs gifted and talented programming or STEM programming or any, anything on uh, you know, uh, the spectrum of needs that we get that available to the student at the, where they are in their home school so that they can go to school and play with the same kids at home in the neighborhood. Um, and so that, that's, that's the future of the, where we're headed with the district. Um, you know, the magnet programming, like I said, maybe works a little bit better in a larger environment, but it just has, it did not serve the purposes and needs of this district. It kind of was counterintuitive because yes, we have had to unwind as we did the redistricting and such, uh, we had to have extensive conversations about um, unwinding sort of the impact of Harriet Bishop, for instance. Um, we knew that there was going to be folks that had, you know, their eldest child had gone through Harriet. Now they were hoping to get their sibling in behind and, and bring everybody through. And we had to give some grace in that as we, as we, you know, ultimately redistrict. Our hope is in the next two to five years, everybody is going to be so happy to stay right where they are in their local elementary school that we don't need to uh, address those issues. Thank you. Yeah. Switching gears a little bit, um, I read a lot of articles about teacher burnout and stress on educators um, related to COVID in particular. And I'm just curious how you're handling it and what you're finding is working uh, to support the educators in your system. Well, I'm gonna let Dr. Battle go, but I'll tell you on the very small microcosm what I did. My, our, my kids' teachers got total wine gift certificates this year, not, uh, not Starbucks gift certificates. <laughs> that was my solution. <laughs> but I'll let Dr. Battle handle the more uh, uh, educational component to that. So when we received notice that uh, Governor Walsh was going to uh, stop uh, schooling in person, over eight days, we transformed our entire system. And so when I reflect back on what has started from the beginning in March and what has uh, helped us throughout our response has been to really listen to those who have to implement whatever decision that I'm about to make. And so we're in a health pandemic. So it was really important for our school nurses to take a really critical role in education and information. And so 
all employees, that fear that still happens today, what is this? And then really a close collaboration with our, um, our, our curriculum instruction and assessment to really listen to teachers what they need. While uh, Director Hume said we were somewhat well poised because we had a tech levy, which was a one-to-one -one for middle and high school and a two-to-one for elementary. And then we were able to purchase additional learning devices from that uh, tech levy. Teaching in a virtual environment is a skill that teachers have to learn. And so to recognize that and to give grace to people um, and to be flexible and pivot when we needed to, but really that strong collaboration. And it was interesting, the teacher said, some teachers who had never used our district curriculum and instruction department before actually saw the expertise and the value. And I think also the other thing is uh, letting people show their expertise and talents, their virtuosities, but allowing people to be vulnerable and say, I need help. And that's really what I think has helped but it has, even our students will tell you, learning in a virtual environment is very difficult, but they appreciate the grace and flexibility and creativity and resourcefulness of the staff. And so for me, it's tapping into that and then supporting when they need it. And so we've done some survey of our families and our students and overwhelmingly in the high 90s that they understood we health was the priority, we kept them safe, they knew the health protocols, and that the instruction has dramatically improved from last spring for that emergency response. So we piloted a couple of things in the summer that we heard from feedback from teachers and parents and students, and one was to have synchronous learning, not the asynchronous. So to have a set time. Mm -hmm. So I'll end with the brain needs predictability. As much as we like things to be different and try new things, it needs predictability. And so using the science that we know to help through this time. So people needed that set synchronous time. Um, and then really providing more at-home learning materials and more materials to teachers and applications um, that they could share with each other, I think has really helped us through this time. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of people uh, reinventing the wheel of di dis district to district and classroom to classroom. And so being able to combine um, the knowledge, bring together the ideas is, is powerful. Yeah, I don't think any teacher graduated from college with the intention of doing what they're doing today and you know, right now. But um, I will say, you know, it, I, we have been amazed uh, whether it's anecdotally or listening to social media or whatever it is, um, the, the examples that we have seen, the resourcefulness, the creativity, um, the persistence and the resistance that uh, has been shown by our teachers, it's, it's amazing. And this board is committed to celebrating that and acknowledging that as much as we can. We, um, we've also instructed Dr. Battle to um, uh, you know, try to remove as many barriers for our teachers as we can along the way. Um, we recently had a conversation about what to do with QComp uh, next year. Um, you know, that's often a, can be a con con an ongoing conversation of how best to do what was originally intended with that money. This year, we just said, you know, let's let's do some evaluations and get the money in the teachers' hands because that's that's where it's because they're doing their jobs, they're doing what they can given the environment they're in. So we're trying to keep as many barriers out of the way and, um, and, and make it as easy as possible to do their jobs. Um, you know, and, and they're all having individually different experiences. Uh, Dr. Battle and I sit in a COVID uh, advisory board that meets once a week. And, um, you know, we heard from our, uh, the, the teacher's representative, uh, the union leadership uh, saying that she is just hearing literally two different things, you know, every end of the spectrum from her people. Some are can't wait to get back in the classroom and some are scared and don't want to go anywhere near a classroom. So it's everything in between, you know, and so it's not a unified experience either for all the teachers. I'm going to ask a question about publicity. As I said years ago, and I think this was around 2000 when the school board uh, brought back the communications committee and it was after a referendum failed. And what we had found out was people just didn't know enough about the school district. So 
I don't, we had somebody in every district, in every school, sending something like on a weekly basis to the communication person. But my question is, given the fact that I don't know how many people pay attention or get the local newspaper anymore. I mean, it's now a matter of you have to apply for it and it's mailed and, and it's the deal is you can get it without paying for it. But how many of the people that you know, you know, have you done a survey within like within the parents that have kids in the school district, do they get that newspaper? Or how many other ways are there that you can communicate other than what the kids take home? Yeah, I can, I can speak to that. Um, we do a, a pretty comprehensive community survey, um, certainly every time before we go out for a referendum. Um, usually the school board wants to hear what um, the community would support before they are going to bother to ask for it. And, uh, and then to hear what issues are important and, and what sort of um, questions need to be answered. And, and as part of that, we always ask, where do you get your information about schools? Where would you like to get your information about schools? And again, I've, I've only been in the district for about 10 years, but um, in 2011, when we did a referendum renewal, I think that was 2011, um, we did that survey and newspaper was still either one of the, it maybe was second right behind um, you know, newsletters from school, that, that's where they got their information about schools. Uh, but by the time we did it more recently, it had dropped out of the top three or four um, pretty pretty completely. Um, and we've done a little bit more intensive, uh, in-depth um, sort of marketing uh, surveys of families that have open and rolled out, for instance, um, to other school districts to find out where they're getting their information. And um, this is, wouldn't be too surprising, especially as we're getting more and more millennial parents. Um, their primary source of information is their peers. It might be through social media, um, but the, the word of mouth um, and from peers, and that's who they, and that's getting information from people they trust um, is where they get their information. So our traditional um, sort of methods of marketing or communicating, like pushing out a press release or something like that, just are not gonna be very effective um, with today's parents. Um, so we do uh, a lot of e-news, you know, pushing out our own information, try to be um, uh, active in communicating rather than, rather than passive. Uh, and then this year, especially, we're starting to ramp up our actual um, sort of marketing, strategic marketing plan, uh, and, and especially around enrollment. Um, we'll really see a lot of this over the next couple of months where um, we're targeting social media, we're being very targeted in, in the advertisements that we'll be putting out and pushing out uh, the messages that counteract what assumptions people might be making about our schools, um, particularly around the middle schools. We found that that's a key area um, where people have misinformation or they have very strong feelings they've heard from other people about, about our middle schools, negative perceptions about our middle schools. And so uh, what we're trying to be is really strategic, really targeted about the information that we're pushing out so that we're you know, not, not just sharing good news about the district. Yes, it's great that our uh, quiz bowl team qualified for nationals, you know, and, and uh, we've got a chess team that won nationals almost every year. And uh, those are all really great stories. Um, those aren't the things, though, that we found that move people toward feeling more comfortable about staying in or excited about staying in our schools. Instead, we need to let them know about uh, that the school is safe, uh, that the school supports students in, and families in a way that makes a difference for the students, uh, that the students' experience is going to be positive, fun, and, and nurturing so that they can go on to have success at the next level and the next level beyond that. Um, so that's where, that's where we're headed um, right now. It's going to be a long road, as people have said. I mean, these uh, perceptions are pretty well embedded. Um, and, uh, you know, we're a long ways away from turning everything around. Uh, but I think we can be headed in the right direction, in part based on the, so the marketing communications work we're doing. But even more importantly, that the program we're trying to put in place, that Pathways, uh, Pathways program, basically from pre-K through 12, um, that we're putting in place for students um, so that they really can have that positive experience, that they really can be prepared to succeed and find their path uh, into the future. Well, I know that during the which marketing research is my first career. And so talking about readership surveys and branding and brand building and all of those things just gets my, my tech heart going. <laughs> Sorry, Sandy, I, I cut you off. I was going to say that during this past campaign, uh, there was somebody that made a comment that obviously they didn't know about 
the pathways at the high school because he had said that you know we need not everybody goes to college and as I said you've already got that program and this person should have known about it but it was quite obvious he didn't <laughs> so that's again it goes back to communication and as I said it in our district, we really don't have a real viable, at least since they started mailing it. It should be easier, but it's not. Uh, so it's really hard to communicate with people uh, on any particular mode. I mean, it's as I said, you, you really need to go. There are so many ways that you need to be looking at it, but that's, I mean, I, you know, I know you've got a really tough job and I know that the, I know when I've talked with the uh, Burnsville uh, Council, I mean, they do a tremendous job. They know what you're doing. And I mean, they are very vocal about highlighting all the great things that are do going on in 191. So, I mean, you've got some people that are out there yeah, that are trying to. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing one minute videos on digital advertising, social media with with kids who feel loved and enthusiastic showing off the facilities at Burnsville High School. Um, you know, it's like catch people in their heart. Parents want their kids to want to know that their kids are loved where they are. And that's the biggest fear. And, you know, show that and show it, don't tell them and do it in digestible bits because that's all people have patience for. And, um, but, but like I said, I can't help myself. It's, it's, it's my training. Uh, Senator Carlson, I think I saw you were trying to say something a moment ago. Uh, yes, I have a question about uh, uh, non-English speakers. Now, I don't know if there are any local papers that are non-English. I mean, we have you know the Sun this week, obviously, but uh, I think Burnsville has a tremendously large population of uh, either non-native English speakers or non-English speakers. And I'm wondering if there is a, a paper that you have or any number of papers that might not be in English and that uh, those are being used also to communicate. And I, and I don't mean those that might be metro wide. I'm, I'm talking about local so that they could talk about local issues in those papers. And I, I, I don't even know if you have those. So are you aware of anything like that? I'm not aware of anything uh, local um, for anything. I think there are there is more of a, a grapevine kind of effect uh, in our especially uh, Somali speaking um, community that they kind of know um, who to go to for information and and uh, um, a lot of times actually. Fortunately, we have some really great uh, both Somali and um, Spanish speaking liaison cultural liaisons who are very well connected in their community. And so um, they do a good job supporting our families and then helping us uh, to reach out to them as well. And, um, but it's a, it's a huge task, obviously. These are families that uh, if they're uh, new immigrant families or relatively recent immigrant families, um, you know, trying to navigate a system as complicated as uh, the American educational system. Um, so uh, it is a big challenge, that's for sure. I think the, the the role of our cultural liaisons can't be under, uh, as, you know, under um, uh, represented here. They they have been a huge asset in connecting um, our communities, um, our new communities to the to the to the schools, um, and um, giving them a uh, giving them an opportunity to have a voice. and And I will say, everything that Aaron's department puts out, um, and we do communicate quite a lot with our community. Um, everything comes out uh, in English. Um, uh, Spanish and um, Somali. Is that right, Ernie? I think the three is uh, typical. Um, so, um, you know, on that alone, I mean, just even under, you, know, you got to appreciate the challenge that goes with that. Aaron writes it up in English. Uh, we probably should find an Aaron that speaks all three, but we, I don't think they exist. So <laughs> he's then got to go get translation and stuff. So it's, it's, it's always a challenge, you know, but, um, and we have auto dialing uh, services that we utilize. So, um, to the point where I've started recognizing the phone number on my phone. Sometimes I get two or three calls a day, but you know, it's the principal telling me from my kid's school, Hey, this, don't forget, this is coming up this weekend. It's a, uh, you know, it's Dr. Battle saying something to the community. We, we, we are off. We are communicating quite a lot with the community, but uh, Liz, you're correct. We have a, we have a long road and I'm super, I'm a big advocate of exactly what you're talking about is uh, 
letting people see what's happening, letting them experience it in emotional little nuggets and bits. That's, that's, a, that's a winning way to get people invested in the community. But what I am seeing even more and more recently is positive social media platforms run by parents who are um, interested in supporting. They're, they're honest, they're straightforward, but um, um, you know, they've been very clear. They won't tolerate uh, just uh, unsolicited bashing in the district. It's there to have a, a honest community conversations. And so there's a core of folks out there that want to be engaged and are, are and, you know, getting there more and more. So. Yeah. One of the, one of the uh, uh, neatest experiences I had a few years ago was the uh, Somali students had put this, uh, um, I'm not sure what you would call it, but it was an entertainment night at Egan High School. And when I talked with some of the students, they said, you know, some of them were from Egan, but some of them were not. And they said, oh yes, we're having the same thing at Burnsville High School in, and I don't remember if it was a couple of weeks or a month separated, but I never did see exactly when that was. I wanted to attend that one as well. And uh, um, you know, I have to say that there's a guy that in the secretary of state's office that all of the elected people have probably run across that person and he's Somali and he lives in Egan. And I told him about the Somali student entertainment and he was, he was thrilled and he did go to the Burnsville one. He was absolutely thrilled and he, he heard that from me. And so what, <laughs> something that we could do to make sure that I know what's happening on that side of the uh, of the cultural divide and also so that he knows too that that would be uh, you know that it brings a lot of community together and i have to say that those uh, the students did just an incredible job too it was great now i guess i'd like to spin back to uh what we were talking about in the start here and that's the the bill that uh, we may be able to get through. And I wanted to ask Greg, is, was there any objection to that other than just, hey, this is the way we do it. We have that in law that you have to put it into uh, uh, offsetting debt, or is that an old law that maybe uh, is time for it to, to go away and give the locals more control? I think Jim, uh, you can apply for an exemption and I think that's probably the, the best way to go about it. Uh, as I mentioned, it was a smaller school district two years ago that had a similar request and it went through rather easily. But, you know, I think part of it is just to protect uh, local citizens about their bonding capability and making sure that uh, districts are making good, good decisions in retiring bonds versus uh, new initiatives. And so it falls in our, in our uh, on our plate as legislators to kind of um, ask for exemptions, mm -hmm. but I don't see a need to really change the overall statute myself. Okay, okay. You touch on you know if that's it has a historical background that really the history has gone away. You you touched briefly on a point that I I admit I've had a little bit of thought and concern about, and that is the example that we were given, and I. I hope there was others, but at least the one example was relatively small amount of um, money in our situation is going to be probably significantly more. And I'm just wondering if that's a challenge we need to consider or prepare for. Um, if, there, if anybody maybe even cares what the amount is, if, if it, you know, if, you know, if you're doing it, it's either yes or no. So what, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's more the concept of uh, providing some flexibility rather than the amount. But I think it'd be, it, one of the things that is important is that in presenting the bill, uh, legislators will want to know, you know, give me a breakdown of the uh, proceeds from the sale and where the money is going. That's uh, more important, but I don't, I, I think it's more conceptually um, that they're willing to provide an exemption rather than you know, hold, hold the law um, just as it's stated for everybody. So I think an exemption is, is something that uh, can be granted fairly easily, put it that way. 
I'm going to push back a little bit because of my, one of my first questions was how much money are we talking about? Just to understand what's going on, um, Greg, not to say that it's not the, that it's the deal making or breaking thing, but it's hard to know how to think about it coming in with, with less background than you have without having a sense of the scope. And I think that's the difficult part for us at this moment to answer just because um, our, our thinking was that we needed the legislation prior to engaging in, in, a, in a conversation too far down the path with regard to a final um, contract potential. And, and at the same time, we have multiple locations that we would be considering. And we know that there's the state statute, which is what we're referring to. But we also know from our attorneys that there is a, a federal um, piece that we have to be aware of too. And that is if the, if the party that we're in, engaging in, in that contract is a um, private entity, then that adds some concern with regard to our, our, our taxable versus non-taxable bonds and the proceeds. Since we're dealing with a little bit from a multiple number of different issuances, it becomes pretty concerning because we don't want to make those, those bond payments all of a sudden now um, taxable when they may otherwise have been non-taxable when they were originally issued. So we have that caveat to deal with as well. So, you know, some of it, at this point in time, the current law says that that money needs to go into the debt service and, um, and pay back the taxpayers. Um, if we get state statute to be the exemption, our understanding is, and that can then direct the money to the general fund and we'd like to see it in the unassigned so that it can be utilized as the board determines. Um, the challenge though, is we still have the federal caveat and it may require that we still have to pay off some debt. So for instance, Metcalf Middle School does still have eight point, almost $3 million um, assigned to it yet that needs to be considered in that process on the federal level, if um, even if we have the exemption at the state level. So it's hard for me to answer that straight out just because we know we have that. We know that we have um, River Ridge Education Center, which has, I believe, now I'm going off memory, so forgive me, but I think it's almost $2 million. And so um, those are those are um, two examples, for example, and we have all of the list of all of our, our um, different buildings we're talking about and, and what that debt is, so we can provide that information easily. I just don't have it up in front of me at the moment. No, that's that's fine, and I'm to be clear. I'm thinking how do you, how the, if if people are objecting or concerned, that's a, a thing. It's easier to answer and get it out of the way than have it become people saying, "Oh, and if it's this, and then they get all dramatic." Um, and but just kind of know what what it is, and then bring them back to the point uh, of the principal and the and the the concept and approving the concept, but I don't like going into stuff unprepared with, with data to be able to manage questions that I would ask. Um, I wanna be able to, um, one of the things on the agenda is what do we need? I wanna be able to hold off and answer those questions so that people let them go and go back to the important thing, which is the core question that, um, that Greg articulated early on. I'm, I'm assuming in the process, you're going to retire some debt, some bond debt from the sale. Well, if it were River Ridge Education Center, for example, I do not believe we would be selling that property for very much more than what the debt is that we owe on it. Mm -hmm. So that would be challenging in that particular example. However, let's take a different example like Metcalf Middle School. And if somebody were to step forward with a very um, promising offer that could allow us to pay off a portion of the debt, but then have a significant amount that could potentially go through an exemption to the general fund. That would be ideal, I think, from the board's perspective. Okay. Lots more conversations to be had about that in the coming months, for sure. Um, I, we could probably go for another two hours if we wanted to, but I do want to be somewhat respectful of everyone's time. So maybe we'll pause here and see if there's any final questions before we wrap up. You know, in getting back to the, the sale of the property, 
I'm assuming that that property is going to be placed back on the tax rolls, whoever purchased it. So, I mean, there's, there's some gain there to be made as well. Certainly, especially if it's a private entity, yes. Right, and, and that might be something that uh, would be good to have as a piece of information if a bill is to go forward and you are going to be testifying. So just a comment. Good point. And I'd, I'd like to ask another question about that, what we talked about earlier with uh, with regard to the, the encumbrances on the properties. Now, you, you were saying that Egan has said that that would be single family homes and no other, uh, that they wouldn't want to consider any kind of higher density. Is that something that you have in a contract or is that something that's just been an assurance by the the present council. Uh, and I'm wondering if, uh, if something like that actually constrains you to who you would go to, to see if you could sell the property to them. Yeah, and, and does it re reduce the market value and what you would be able to, to uh, realize out of that property? Yeah, very good question. And in the work that we are doing, we are um, working with Ellers and Associates um, as assistance for the purpose of understanding the development or redevelopment of whatever property that may be sold. And we understand and know that Burnsville 2040 plan is a little bit more defined as to exactly how they would utilize the, the land, which is, you know, right here at Diamond Head, for example, if we were to sell some acreage of our, of our parking lot. Um, while Egan, which is where Metcalf Middle School lies, and it's right on the very edge of the city, um, they have not looked at that particular piece of property or that area uh, for anything other than what is current, um, currently zoned. And so therefore, whoever would be interested in that property, if it's for redevelopment, they would need to go through the process of working with the city to obtain an understanding of what zoning would be allowed and to get that change made so that that would be part of that process. And um, it is possible that that may very well inhibit uh, the proceeds in the fact that they may need to really consider how it is that they're going to utilize that and be able to to make that profitable on their end as well and then what it means for us as um, you know um, the the individuals who are selling the property so it's it's um it's something that all who are interested in reaching out to Ellers as as we speak and as they do so they they know and understand that and it's a question of is it as is? How would they use that building? Would they look to, to actually demolish it, which, you know, the city of Burnsville has maybe more options available rather than the city of Egan because they're not eligible for some options there for demolition grants. So it just, um, it's a factor of that particular property and it's something that's going to have to be considered by whoever may be interested in, in obtaining it. You know, just, just for a point of interest, it was, uh, about a mile and a half east of there, on the other side of Sandy's house, there was a small piece of property that was next to a, a strip mall that they were talking about having a, uh, a senior housing. I think it was senior housing, wasn't it, Sandy? That yep. they were going to do there, and uh, the neighborhood just went crazy about it because it was just a very poor place to put that. But this might be a place where there's could be some senior housing and generally the senior housing is going to be owned by a nonprofit. So if that happens, then there isn't property taxes on it either. So you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of con convolutions that could happen. And, you know, and I look at that piece of property that, uh, you know, that may be a good place for multiple housing or for senior housing or for something that, uh, that we have to look into the future and see you know, where do these places, uh, where, do, where do these pieces of property go that are close to transportation and close to a mall and close to uh, employment, uh, all of those kinds of things you know, is, you know, and, and I don't think we should artificially limit them. For workforce housing, and, and I'm sitting here wondering if the newly adjusted city council in Egan would be in a, uh, a council that would want to be thinking about that. Anything can change with a vote. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a fairly sizable piece of property. I don't think people actually realize how much land is available there. I think when we were talking about whether it was a wholesale sale or piece off sale and keep the building, I, we saw how many, how, if we had just kept the building, how many houses did they say they could build there? Or single family dwellings? Well, and it'd be 10 acres that you could sell with, without and still have 25 acres remaining, or you could sell all 35 acres. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's sizable beyond that, just the building there. That doesn't include the strip mall and the car wash either. No, yeah. that, and that unfortunately is a, that's on the Burnsville side. And um, that's a counter problem because that, you know, uh, that needs to go away, but, <laughs> but the Burnsville's <laughs> dealing with that, I think. So. <laughs> well, actually that's a private owner. So the right, city yeah. can't, it's owned by a private. Well, individual. they're working on it. Yeah, I know they, what they can do. <laughs> It sounds like you're working with Ellers and they can really give you a lot of options and and how you proceed. So they're they're well schooled in school district finances. So yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. If there's nothing else, I think we can wrap up. I want to thank the four of you for joining us this evening. It's been, I think it's been a really good conversation. And I'm sure we'll have more in the coming months. Yes, thank you Lots again, everybody. About. Thank yeah, you very much for your time. This should thank be you for the invitation. We just got our committees, and we're still trying to get get a grasp on that. So, uh, uh, once we do figure out where our committees are going to be, uh, where we are going to be on committees, and uh, what uh, you know what priorities we want to try to press those on, uh, I think it's it's worth getting together again, and that's not too far in the future. Absolutely. So, Oh, yeah, yes, for sure. Thank you. Okay. Yes, well, have a Merry you. Christmas. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Yep. Happy Thank holidays. you. Happy New Year. <laughs> Here's to Bye -bye. a better 2021. Thank you. <laughs> 2020 in the rearview mirror. <laughs>